We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Welcome into Tailgate. Austin Gale here with Mike Renner in sunny Cincinnati. The weather was over 40 degrees, and I made the decision to not wear an additional layer because I'm just done. I'm done. I'm done with – if the weather is over 50 – You've started spring yourself. Yes. I, yeah. Sometimes you have to take control. Yeah. I, if it's over 40 degrees, I'm wearing one layer. That's it for the rest of the year. <laughs> Maybe not December, but, like, it has to be done. It has to be done. It was funny growing up in when I was in Wisconsin. I remember that – it was 50 degrees was the cutoff for shorts as a kid. Like that's what we like would talk about. It's like, oh, it's over 50, we're wearing shorts. But that was how skewed your perception was living in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it never gets above 50. It's still like freezing the shit there. So uh, I'm getting soft though in, in my old age. I don't like mm -hmm. the cold anymore. That's, those days are over. I, I realized I said maybe not in December, but it doesn't matter. I think 40 degrees is the is the cutoff for me. Anything under 40, I'll wear a jacket. Anything over 40, I'm wearing one layer. That's I, I, I just I feel like I have to change. I have to change to take advantage of the city here. Um, on the Catch and Early Buzz, we talked a little bit about the Derek Carr contract. The official details are out. So it's a according to over the cap, in 2022, he's got a, I think, uh, over across everything, it's a $25 million salary in 2022 pretty much all guaranteed and then after that they don't guarantee he's if they could cut him up to three days after the super bowl and only have 5.6 million dollars in dead cap so just the prorated bonuses in 2023 2024 and 2025 they'd be on the hook for so why would you cut him right after the super bowl you just won though exactly the so exactly they obviously that gives him some time after he wins the super bowl so like hey do we still want him all yeah. of that so you i think you made a great point yesterday when you said hey how often do teams even do that, though? How often do teams say, like, oh, yeah, we can cut him? Is, I, and I would think that the range of outcomes that's most likely, again, is that he plays well enough to not get cut, but not well enough to go deep in the postseason. Like, that, that honest, that's what, given the strength of the division, how terrible that offensive line is in Las Vegas, that's what I think ultimately happens with Derek Carr. So they end up probably going to pay him $35 million next year, even though they don't necessarily have to, because he's going to fall in that range of outcomes where he's good enough to yeah. stick around in Las Vegas, but what what it does do for them, go ahead. Is it is it opens up trading to you don't have the Carson Wentz dead hit if you do want to trade him dead cap hit. Mm -hmm. So if if you do want to trade him, it, it makes him less attractive to trade partners, but it makes it more amenable to your cap to move on from him via trade. Uh, the reason I wanted to bring it up again is one to provide some more details on the contract. I still think that this was the smartest decision by the Las Vegas Raiders. Cause if the range of outcomes hits that he isn't good next year, like they missed the playoffs, like what you, okay, let's talk about that. Derek Carr plays. Okay. Raiders missed the playoffs. They win eight games. They're not expected to make the playoffs. I think they're like mm -hmm. plus plus one ninety to make the playoffs. Are you going to just pay him that money and, and just continue they to are. ride this out? Yes, that's what I'm saying. They are. Yes. That feels ridiculous though. Why? That, he's a good quarterback. Now, the $35 million 2023 is like where you would fall, where he would fall in the pantheon of NFL quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. It's the $43 million in 2024 and the $43 million 2025 where it starts to so get So this is kind of a two-year bet, you're saying. Probably. Yeah, yeah. two-year bet with the $25 million hit in 2022 and then the $35 million hit in 2023. I, I'm of the opinion that if this offense is not top 12 next year and they miss the playoffs – I'm considering it. I'm at least considering it. He hasn't won a playoff game in his career. Yeah. Like, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, at least Kirk Cousins has done that. Like, Kirk Cousins has won playoff games. Like, that matters. So, I, I, I would at least be asking the question if they don't make the playoffs. Hell, the 49ers are asking the question when they make the Super Bowl and yeah. are trading up and going to get or chasing eliteness at the position. Raiders, meanwhile, excited to compete for third or fourth in division in 2022. The reason I wanted to bring it up again, though, was Good Morning Football was ranking him in the AFC. And a lot of the group, obviously I'm a Good Morning Football alum, and you go on next week, 
was saying he is. A top five QB in the AFC? He's the fourth best quarterback in his own division. It's fun. It's easy to say, you know, oh, he's a top 10 quarterback, oh, he's a top five quarterback, until you put out a list. Yes. And are you going to put him ahead of Patrick Mahomes? No. Joe Burrow? No. Deshaun Watson? Absolutely not. Justin Herbert? No. Russell Wilson? No. Or Josh Allen? No. There's six. And I would include Lamar Jackson right after that. Like, I'm not putting him, I'm not putting Garrett Carr ahead of Lamar Jackson. Lamar so, Jackson so won at, an MVP. At best, if, if, even if you want to put him above Lamar Jackson, like Lamar Jackson last year, just say that's him the rest of his career. Sure, you can put Derek Carr above him. So at best, he's seventh. Because he's, he's in, to me, the, the, tier, the tier of Lamar Jackson, Ryan, Matt Ryan, and Ryan Sandhill. Yes. He's in that tier. He's comfortably ahead of Tua Tungvaluwa, Mitch Trubisky, and then the, the second-year players, right? Trevor Lawrence, Davis Mills, Mac Jones. Well, Zach like, Wilson. he's ahead of them, but there very well could exist a world where he's not ahead of them also. Yes. You know? <laughs> like, yes. Like, tre- who would, would you rather have Trevor Lawrence right Trevor Lawrence? Why does that not sound right? Trevor Lawrence right now or Derek Carr? Obviously, Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, even then, you would probably still rather have those guys and what they could become. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I don't think he's even sniffing top five in the AFC. And he's borderline outside the top 10, bro. If Trevor Lawrence takes a step forward, yeah. if Matt, Matt Jones, Jones even just plays as well as he did last year, yeah. that, is, uh, that is the concern, right? That, again, comes back to like the concern of, okay, you're, you're not chasing eliteness at the most important position in football if – Again, this offense isn't top 12, and you're missing the playoffs next year, and you're still like, screw it. Let's pay him 35 mil. Let's do it. And, and just commit to mediocrity and commit to purgatory in the NFL. Before we get to – we're what, we're all in reverse order today. Mm-hmm. We have – we're going to go trivia, then the speak pipes, then the mailbag questions that we'll get to. Before we get into that, I want to highlight – the presenting sponsor of this podcast, it is Manscaped. The only true guaranteed quality pickup this season is Manscaped, the leaders in below the waist grooming and above the waist if you like them. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 for your skill position will be sleek and smooth enough for the 4340. Support us and head to manscaped.com and use exclusive code PFF at checkout. Because of the ceramic blades, skin safe technology, your nicks and snags will be reduced. In the season, in the season of trimming the roster, Manscaped will make sure cutting you're cutting the right players and not any important pieces of your D. Look, fellas, don't fall off her draft board. The ladies out there think that long nose hair is a major turnoff. The Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer is your solution. Why not use the best tools for the job here? Get 20% off and free shipping with the code PFF at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code PFF at manscaped.com. Turn your Mr. Irrelevant into a first-round pick with Manscaped. Let's get to trivia. Quinnebago, hit us. All right. First question. This is from Lance Storer on Twitter. Lance keeps sending us questions. He sends them like every week. He, uh, he wants you to guess this player. I played for four seasons at Kansas State, racking up 25 and a half sacks and 39, tackle, 39 and a half tackles for loss. I got yeah. drafted with the 73rd pick in the 2017 draft to my Bengals. My career stats to this point are eight and a half sacks and 12 tackles for loss. Who is it? Don't tell me, Mike. I know exactly who it is, and I, I just can't remember his name. He had that insane three-cone. Yeah. Uh, what was his name? I, no longer on the Bengals. Yeah. Oh, That's my gosh. I, it's going to make me so upset. Give me a second. I think he went to the 49ers. Um, Jets, maybe? Maybe Niners. I know it's, I know it's not Wyatt Hubert. I'm saying it's, it's the— Wyatt Hubert's currently on the Bengals. Yeah. It's Wyatt Hubert is currently on the Bengals. And he went to Kansas State. Who is it? Jordan Willis. Jordan Willis. That's it's who he's Jordan exactly. Willis. Yep. You got a, it. That was a great one. That's good. It's a good one from Lance Storer. I hardly know her. Anything else? Uh, yeah, we got another one that says Trayvon Walker currently has minus 550 odds to go in the top five according to DraftKings. Name the last three Georgia Bulldogs who were drafted in the top five. Georgia Bulldogs. All right. Was AJ Green a top five pick? AJ yeah. Green was a top was five four. pick. Yes, sir. Good, good get. Um, hmm. Andrew Thomas? Yeah. Nice. You got one more. Uno Mosh. Todd Gurley? No, he's no, not Todd Gurley. Um, come on, Michael. Figure it out. Go back a little bit. Back. Oh, okay, oh, deeper no. than AJ Green. Oh, no. Before oh, no. AJ Green or after AJ Green? Uh, before AJ Green, yeah. Well, before AJ oh, Green. Wow. Okay, we're going back a little bit then. All right. I can do this because right, Roquan was not a top. He was top ten, but not top five. Uh, it's also after AJ Green. Yeah. Hmm. 
Don't tell me. I'm going to get this. Good player? Yes. Some might say very good, depending on who you talk to. Oh, my gosh. An absolute stud? There was some debate about it not too long ago, including people. Matt Stafford. Matt Stafford, yep. Wow, that's solid. That's a good pull. That's a good pull. That's a good pull. Here we yeah. go. I didn't want to say going harking back to our quarterback rankings earlier because mm-hmm. that would have gave it away. But, yeah, it was Matt Stafford. Nice. Uh, last awesome. question here is from Obi Observe Man Twenty Four on Twitter. He keeps he sends us a lot of questions too, so keep doing that. Thank you, Obi. Uh, he wants to know, and this is going to test your guys' uh, recent knowledge, like how well you've retained your work oh, um, in the twenty twenty one draft. Ten players who were in the top thirty two on PFS Big Board did not go in the first round. Okay, name those players. Twenty twenty one. So that would be Jeremiah Uskaramo is definitely one of them. Yep. Trayvon Merrick's one of them. Yep. Um, Christ. That's tough, dude. That's super tough. Uh, Who were you high on last year just absurdly? I don't know. I, it's... Uh, Elijah Moore. Yes, sir. This is deep. Top 32. Yeah, I don't know. This one's tough. I have, I have no recollection. I feel like I've deleted that draft in my brain. I know, right? So it's like, think of any player. <laughs> you're, you're three for three so yeah. far. Yeah. Um, shit, there's definitely... Think of certain um, positions. Rondale Moore? Uh, yeah. No. No? He wasn't in the top 32? No, he was not. Makes sense. I'm trying to think of certain even positions. I know. got a few tackles in there if you oh, want to start taking a stab okay at that. um the north coast state tackle uh yep dylan radins dylan, dylan radins uh i don't think i had cosme i think he was a little beyond that but i think tevin jenkins tevin De- jenkins yeah was how many do we have six five five six six Ooh. let's go come on can... Fine. one more tackle one more tackle Not no. There's that fucking run on tackles. Was it Sam Cosme? Was he in the top thirty-two? No, not Sam Cosme. The other guy that was like sort of in that range. I know. There's a bunch of guys came off the board from like hmm. the one like Jenkins, and then it went Cosme, Raidens. Not Jackson Carmen. Not Jackson. That's Carmen. a hint. He was like this. I think his board number was near where he ended up coming. It was. I think it was almost exactly. I was yeah. looking that up earlier. I'm out. I'm out. Yeah, I'm not. I'm I'm running dry here. Who, who was it? Walker Little. Okay. Oh, Walker Small. Duh. That one I should have Christian Barmore. Mm. Duh. Duh. Terrace Marshall Jr. Okay. Asante Samuel Jr. Okay. And Aziz Ojolari. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel good about those still. I don't. Where no. most of them end up coming forward. Bullshit. Yeah. Well, maybe you guys should remember your work I a know. little more. Yeah, my draft board. I just I, remember where they go, and then I'm just like, was I high? Was I low? It's tough. That's it. That's all we got for Triv. Shall we get to the speak pipes then? Let's speak pipe. Yep. Let's do speak pipes. This Pipe fir- first one is from Nate. Hey, guys. I'm just wondering when it's okay to reach on a player. You guys often say not to be overconfident with your evaluation, like when Austin's Raiders drafted Alex Leatherwood at 17. But, for example, George Pickens is my wide receiver one. I think he's being dropped too far for reasons people are overlooking for other guys like Derek Stingley. But – if you know your wide receiver one is somewhere between wide receiver six and wide receiver eight for most GMs, where does it make sense to take them? Thanks, guys. That's tough. That one is tough. I think, I think, I think where overconfidence in your own evaluation, it, it, like you didn't mention it, but like it comes back to the consensus board a little bit. Like I think you have to factor in like what what you feel consensus opinion I think is that's on what player. He's saying. He okay. said if he's six eight for most people. Yeah. So I think it comes back to then trade like. The, the problem with yeah. what the Raiders did for most of their was that they never traded back to get those guys. Mm-hmm. So if you know that no one else in the NFL is going to value them highly, you know you can get them later. Go get them later. You know, yeah. like go go get more picks to get your guy later if you think he's that good. That's, I think, what it comes back to. It's don't just stand pat and not 
accrue more value on top of what you think is a valuable player. That I agree with. Next speak pipe. All right, this next one we'll go with uh, we'll go with Dan, the number one fan. Good afternoon, Austin Gale and Mike Renner. I hardly know her, Renner. It's your Got boy it. Dan, comma number one fan on the East Coast. Listen, first things first. I just want to say there is a surprisingly large tailgate fan fiction community, and you guys moving in together has given us ammunition for months to come. So I just wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Oh, no. Second of all, this whole Debo Samuel drama has got me thinking, is there ever actually a point in drafting a running back? I know, I know, PFF hates running backs, whatever. But seriously, all of the best running backs right now are good for their receiving talent. Christian McCaffrey, uh, Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, and uh, Debo Samuel. So my question is, would teams be better off drafting wide receivers instead of running backs? And can you name some examples of some wide receivers who have running back type builds over the past few drafts, and maybe especially in this one, that would be good takes? I think you, if Thanks. you asked, if you asked like the a handful of people here at PFF, I think they'd say yes. I, I I do still think that there is skill to playing the running back position. Like guys that have vision, you know, there are very few receivers every year that can actually break tackles. Like actually have the build and the contact balance to be legit tackle breakers in the NFL. I think Jawan Jennings from Tennessee. If you go back, he's probably too tall to play, but like he's a guy that legitimately had good contact balance. Could he play running back? I don't know. The vision is a really big piece of that. Debo Samuel is rare. And I think we oftentimes do this where, oh, man, I need my next Debo Samuel. I need my next Tyreek Hill. You can't you – need, you need the next Patrick Mahomes. You know, you can't replicate oftentimes really rare athletes and really rare talents. So I'm still of the opinion that, yes, you should draft running backs. I, I'm of the opinion that you should exclusively – draft running backs in terms of like don't sign you know like always keep things fresh in yeah. that backfield right like consistently be drafting guys in that day three that day three range of four to seven to where you're constantly like complimenting the backfield bringing new juice and all that stuff you there's a ton of analysis already done on the running back position specifically where you know the peak period of their nfl careers is often very early so if you can get guys on rookie contracts cost controlled rookie contracts and you aren't paying you know veterans high dollar and and having this complimentary backfield i think that is the, the best case scenario i don't think turning receivers into running backs is it's it just i think that's the the exception not the rule yes i, I agree with that and, and the whole don't him saying don't draft running backs i think sort of ignores how depleted most positions are by like the fourth and fifth round you know you can still find guys that contribute at the running back position you're, you're not going to find a lot of contributing wide receivers so a guy guys in the past who have had that skill set i think we've highlighted like amari rogers i thought was a he was like 215 pounds and 511 like the dude was a running back mm -hmm. legitimately build wise last year coming out of clemson went to the packers obviously um the Charger, who'd the Chargers draft that that had like a running back esque build too that I thought could be one of those guys who is out of Virginia. Um, whatever, I'll look that up later. But that, those are two guys past years. This year, I would highlight Dontario Drummond as a guy who makes a lot of sense to flip to running back or be in that mold. But I, I think the other aspect of this that the 49ers themselves are even going to run into or could run into is. You don't want to subject your best wide receivers to more hits. Yeah. You know, like the guys who were saying that are the best, you know, wide receiver running back conversions, like maybe even like the LaVisca Chenault or like Traylon Burks, whatever, they're still more valuable when they are running routes at wide receiver. So, yeah, I, I do think that the whole only draft receiving running backs is a touch overblown in their usage. It's more like, you don't want to throw the running backs in the first place. It's kind of the thing about the running back position. You want to be throwing the football to wide receivers down the football field. Joe Reed was the guy I was thinking of, 2020, uh, to the Chargers. Virginia, but, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I do think that you still want – you still need running back vision and skill set at the end of the day to a degree. Next. I got one for you before yep. we go on. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I don't even want it to happen. 
Do you think Jamar Chase could play running back? Yeah. Yes. I was going to say I do too. I mean, he could do the Debo. He could, he's probably the closest thing to what Debo did. He probably has the skill set that's most replicable of that. There you go. All right. Uh, this next one is from Austin F. Hi, guys. Austin here. Love the show. And my first question is for Austin. Firstly, on the NFL podcast, Steve uh, said that sometimes you just randomly run around upstairs. Can you confirm or deny this? Uh, secondly, what would be your football numbers and positions? Also, no single digit numbers unless you're a quarterback. We go in old school here. Uh, lastly, I think the Lions will not take a quarterback in the draft. Overall, I think that's the right decision. I also think that they will win seven to eight games this year because they have a fairly easy schedule, and I think the one-score games will regress in the positive direction this year as opposed to how they played out last year. Um, it puts them in the, like the 7 to 12 pick uh, range. My question is, after Stroud and Young, who are, who are some guys that we can try and get in that range uh, that we can expect because I don't want to trade up to get Stroud because, to me, that's just a waste of draft capital. Thanks. Also, fuck you, Renner. Dude, so many people hate you. Mm. I don't know why. I I think it's the pretty boy demeanor. People love to hate you. They love to hate me. It's because they know I can take it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, Do I run around upstairs sometimes? Yes. Uh, You literally ran into the podcast room when I was recording the NFL podcast yesterday. Fair. (laughs) That was kind of incredible, actually. I have um, ADD, ADHD combined. Yeah. Did you know you can d- get diagnosed with that? How come you don't have a prescription? I used to, but... Get that refill. Maybe I will. <laughs> maybe I will. Uh, football number, I think I'd go... In high school, I was 53, which is the worst. I didn't think that number was that cool. But I was in that mode where I was like, I don't need a number. I'm just, you know, a mm-hmm. monster. I think I would go like 90... 90 or 91 would be kind of sick. If I played like defensive end and I was like, obviously like six times the size I am now, but yeah. that's where my head's at. What position? I play defensive end. Okay. Defensive end defensive would be sick. I would, I would have been a safety if I played football and I would have worn number 34. 34? Yeah. Wow. Let's Quinn, see. what about you? Uh, so I, my number in all sports is 27, but uh, this is like a little bit of a take. Like uh, tight ends and linebackers that wear numbers in the 40s, I kind of like that. Yeah. People, people hate that, though. Like, if you go on Twitter, like, and you see somebody, like, a linebacker wearing a number in the 40s, they've, they're getting roasted. But I, I actually think it's kind of cool. Maybe that's just me. No, I, li- I like the college approach to people wearing numbers. Like, just wear any number you want. Just look, look sick. Just go prioritize the sick numbers. That's where I'm at, though. Um, his other questions were, he kinda, we kind of got blended there. What was some of the stuff he said? Oh, the next year's draft for the Lions, 7 to 12 range. I know you love Will Levis, mm-hmm. the Kentucky quarterback. He could be in the mix there. Spencer Rattler, comeback season, could be in the mix there. I, I don't know. I, I actually don't love this next quarterback class as much as some people have been hyping it up. It's much, much better than this one. I, I think after Bryce Young, I'm not sure I've seen anyone that's exceptional. And even Bryce Young is going to get fucking torn apart for how small he is. And yeah. he looks like he looks like me out there. That is the skinny dude at the cornerback position that – I'm guessing he's going to live in the weight room this off season. So he's going to have to. Yeah. So I, that, that's why I keep coming back to, you know, maybe Malik Willis too, you know, maybe, maybe. I think because. a lot of that was smoke. If I'm being honest, I, I, what I think happened there was Detroit only benefits from leaking that they're interested in Malik Willis. Right. And that maybe some team wants to yeah. come trade up for it and all that stuff. I'm, buying more and more into the idea that they're going to take Aiden Hutchinson, say the Jacks take Trayvon Walker. They're going to take Kayvon Thibodeau, potentially. I think they're taking an edge up top. Walker's not going number one. Trayvon Walker's not going number one. I just don't want him to take an edge because I was high on Julian Aquara, and I thought he looked good last season. So selfishly, I want him to see the field. Love that. I love the selfish play. Mm -hmm. Any more speak pipes? Yep. Last one is from Andrew in Indiana. Hey, guys. Andrew from Indiana here, and I've got great news. Mike Brown is a huge master gator. He's so impressed with your wit and analysis that he's firing Duke Tobin and promoting you two to co-GM of the Bengals. So you've got two big questions to answer. One, who's on the short list of players you're considering at 31? And two, assuming he's asking for top dollar, how would you handle the Jesse Bates situation? Thanks, and don't let us down. Interesting. How would you handle the Jesse Bates situation? I would simply sign Jesse Bates for top dollar. Yeah. 
I agree. I think just I, I don't understand. I don't I don't know why they're pushing back so much there. When uh, I talked to Doug Hyde, the reporter here at PFF, apparently there's mixed views on Jesse Bates in the league about him being like one of the top you know deep safeties in the NFL. I will say though, from their perspective, two two franchise tags is cheaper than top dollar at safety. You yeah, know? like two franchise tags isn't going to be too much for them. So, from a pure business perspective, they hold a lot of leverage because of. How the, low paid the safety, safety, safety position is, yeah. He changes what they do defensively, too. Like he, oh, for he sure. He can't do that. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just probably because he's asking for a lot, and mm-hmm. they have that leverage, right? The, the cap guy who's in the Bengals room, who in this case would be reporting to us, us. is like, bro, like, yeah. we franchise tag him again, what do we lose? You know, mm-hmm. if he's willing to play on it, we just let him play on it. That's probably, you know, the human element gets lost a bit when the, when the obvious financial gain. I mean, it's like any business, right? It's like when you ask me for a race, it's like, why would I do that? You're a piece of shit, and you're like, damn. You know, like that's kind of like how it goes. But um, it is. How what it would is. I do at 31? I still, I think my favorite thing for the Bengals is a, is corner. Like Andrew Booth Jr., Kyrie Elam. Those are the two names that I consistently see getting yeah. mocked there. I think that is a dream scenario for the Cincinnati Bengals. And I also like what you've recently said about maybe Linderbaum if he saw, falls that far. If yeah. Linderbaum falls that far, you move Ted Karras to guard and you have Linderbaum at center, that offensive line is not just retooled. I think it's. It's on its way up and up, right? That's an insane improvement year over year in, in the trenches. Yeah, so those three guys that you mentioned, I'd also throw Travis Jones in the mix there, the defense tackle. Um, I, I honestly, at this point, if those four, any of those four are on the board, I'd, surpri- I'd be very surprised if it's anyone else. Mm-hmm. And, and then the other guy I think that's kind of maybe short listy is Ab- Abraham Lucas or Bernard Ryman if they want like a guard to tackle guy for the future. But that's that seems like I said probably those first four first. Lovely. So I hope we didn't let them down. Now on to the mailbag. Here are some mailbag questions. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you do, we will answer your questions on the mailbag. Before we get into it, remember this podcast is sponsored by Western Southern Financial Group. While you focus. Focus on your roster moves. Western Southern helps advance your money moves. Buying your first home, planning to start a family, wondering how to make your money grow. Western Southern's playbook of life insurance, investment, and retirement solutions helps you rest assured on game day. Team up to understand needs and address goals with a game plan built just for you. Get started at westernsouthern.com slash PFF. The other thing I'll highlight here is PFF is offering 50% off an elite annual subscription using code DRAFT50. Elite annual gets access to pretty much everything at PFF all the locked article content, the draft guide that has over 400 pages now, 150 prospects, uh, the grades, the advanced data and premium stats. We have grades and premium stats on every player dating back to 2006. You can look at a lot of that historical data, leverage the mock draft simulator, all that stuff. And PFF, remember that promo code is draft 50, 50% off the elite subscription. PFF also launched this podcast called Hutch, a four-part podcast series with the number one overall draft pick, Aiden Hutchinson. It came out yesterday, April 13th. Go check it out, rate, review, and subscribe. YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Show includes interviews with Jim Harbaugh, current and former Michigan players, key members of Aiden's family, media members, and draft analysts. Also, myself. Check out Hutch, wherever you get your podcasts. Mailbag. This is from Justin Casey. No, this is from The Cole. Why was Damian Pierce so underutilized? That is a great question. And I think Florida fans would also like to know an answer. I, I can't give you one. I, I mean, 100 attempts last year for top five running back in this draft when Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker are getting ridden into the ground. So, I don't know. Couldn't tell you. I think a new take that I have is that if you want to draft a running back in the second round, just because we're on running backs, draft Troy Anderson, who was a running back for Montana (laughs) State as a freshman, and know that he can also play off-ball linebacker. Yeah. (laughs) And if you need a running back. I would love to give him a few toss sweeps with his speed. Fuck. Four, four, see what, that what was his like? 40? It was like 442. 442 at his size is insane. 243 pounds. I mean, he's like Derrick Henry. He's a horse. Yeah. It was like our speed pipe question instead of drafting wide receivers to play running back, draft, draft linebackers. linebackers. Yeah, I mean, linebacker is a low value position. I, I had to take draft big running backs to play linebacker. Like, a lot of those guys are the best athletes and they stick at running back. Like, flip some of those dudes to linebacker. Dude, play. Here's the take play Runner Troy Anderson at running back. Let's just try it. Like, try it a little bit. Just some sweeps just here and there. A couple sweeps. This is from Jason Levy. How valuable is Jordan Davis if he can dominate the run like we think he could? Okay. So I went and looked up wins above replacement of prime Damon Harrison. Snacks. The best nose tackle we've seen in the last decade. He 
in his best, in his highest wins above replacement season, was the 10th most valuable defensive tackle in 2017. And so that's basically Damon Harrison was as quintessential a run stuffing nose tackle as it gets. You're just expecting no pass rush whatsoever. He capped out as the 10th most valuable. And in his prime from 2013 to 2018, he was the 10th most valuable DT. Now, if you're telling me you get the 10th most valuable DT, that should be a top 10 pick. You know, like a top 10 DT in the NFL getting that probably going to end up being a top 10 player in the class but is he going to be prime Dan Harrison I mean like that's a high bar to also set to make making a guy the best run defending defense tackle but also like Jordan Davis could be more of a pass rusher than Damon Harrison ever was so yeah that's what you're looking at just in terms of pure run defense if you're asking pure run defense is still can be a top 10 defensive tackle I think Damon I I, I do think that Jordan Davis could go as high as like eight to Atlanta. Like yeah. I don't think I no, think that like betting his prop to go inside the top ten. That's I think it's ridiculous. plus money right now. I think I think makes sense. I think he'd go to the Jets at ten, all that stuff. Shall we go to Justin Casey Fighter? Mike, sure. besides Delta. DeMarvin Leal and possibly Nicobe Dean, which first round lock is most regrettable? Mm. Austin, of all the NFL related people you talk to, who is most different from your previous perception of them? If mass skaters can raise ten thousand dollars for St. Jude's, would Austin be willing to bite off one of Renner's toenails? Yes, ten thousand dollars. I would suck your toe down. I wouldn't let you bite off my toenail for that. that just... We had something like that happen in high school where we played we played Pirates Dice a lot. I don't know if you ever seen Pirates of the Caribbean. They play this game called Pirates Dice. I'm sounding like an asshole now. We play this game where if you lose, you have to do something stupid. Yeah. One guy, one of my friends from back home, his name's Ricky Organ. We were on like a trip in a cabin. This is before we like drank. Mm -hmm. I, obviously before 21. Yeah. This is before we drank in high school either. And we just do dumb stuff all the time. He had to suck my toe for a minute. And it was honestly looking back on it, one of the more regrettable things I've done in my life, like letting it, letting it happen. And you go back to like what he did in his life. It was not okay. And like, we're all like, 14 year old boys just that's sucking like, toes it's not great like it's not great like in hindsight i probably shouldn't even brought it up but that's a that's a tough piece and we didn't get ten thousand to st jude's for that Ugh. it was rough it was rough it was yeah, rough but that's... um go ahead and start with the first question tomorrow okay. Leal, the kobe dean who's your biggest first round lock so i was going to run through the first round locks once again it was cave on thibodeau Derek Stingley Jr., Evan Neal, Aiden Hutchinson, Kyle Hamilton, DeMarvin Leal, Tyler Linderbaum, Garrett Wilson, Iki Aquanu, George Karloftis, N'Kobe Dean, Charles Cross, James Williams, Jordan Davis, Kenny Pickett, Devin Lloyd, David Ajabo, Drake London, Andrew Booth Jr., Ahmad Gardner. Now, full health, DeMarvin Leal is the only one on that list that I would feel like real regret about. I think he's going to fall out of the first round. Mm -hmm. I feel very confident he will. Now, David Ajabo likely going to fall out of the first round as well after tearing the Achilles. That one, outside of my control. Not going to chalk up an L on that one too hard. I think N'Kobe Dean could fall out of the first round. Andrew Booth maybe could fall out of the first round, but cornerback need might keep him there or probably should keep him there. After that, I think everyone else is going to the first round. I would be floored if I miss on any of those other ones. So could go 19, 18 to 20. I'll take it. I'll take it. Of all the NFL people I've talked to, who is the most different from my previous perception? Hmm. That's tough. I mean, a lot of people meet perception. I'm trying to think someone who's like a lot cooler than I thought, maybe. I, I could even go out to NFL media. Hmm. You know who's really cool to hang out with? Yep. I'm going to give him a shout out here. NFL related people. This guy's media. Um, Michael Kist. Oh, yeah. Michael Kist, we hung out with at the Senior Bowl. He is dope. He's a, he's a super fun guy to hang out with. He's uh, a massive, or used to be a massive hardo on Twitter. I think he changed his tone a little bit. He has softened his tone. But my God. Let me let me shout out his Twitter. Did not expect him to be as cool as he was. So he's currently the SB Nation executive producer. Yeah. Uh, he did a lot of stuff with the Eagles in the past. Yeah. Uh, his his Eagles Twitter Eagles. is Michael Kist NFL. He did not make it out to any of the trips this year, though. He wasn't yeah. at Senior World of Combine or anything, so we exactly. didn't, didn't get a chance to link up. But he was uh, fun as hell to hang out with. <laughs> we uh, we had some good times down there in Mobile, so he's a cool guy. I'll give him a shout-out. Owen Hain on Apple Podcasts. Hey, boys. Love the show. My question is, what happened to the hype around Cameron Thomas, San Diego State legend? Nobody ever talks about him and how good he was, and it seemed like everyone has forgotten about him as a prospect. Thoughts on him and where he might go in the draft. Thanks. Go Browns. Cameron Thomas 
has not had a good pre-draft process, right? Well, he hasn't had any. Yeah, he hasn't had any. Yeah. He did have his pro day, and it was a lot better. It was good. Like, it was a good pro day. I think he had, like, a sub-7-3 cone, all that stuff. But wasn't able to, you know, participate the Senior Bowl, wasn't able to participate at the Combine. And at that point, you know, it's difficult to have a guy vaulting up boards when other guys are, like, moving their stock forward. I have him in the Tier 3 of edges behind Ajabo, Benito, Drake Jackson, and Josh Pascal. I do think gone are the days that he's a first-rounder. Like, I don't think that's going to happen, especially with Epichetti raising his stock, Jermaine Johnson raising his stock, Boye Mafe even as well. Uh, I still really like Cameron Thomas. I think the comp I have for him, though, isn't that far off in terms of Curtis Weaver. Like, I, I see a lot of that. Like, I see a lot of – he wins similarly in that – it's not sometimes pure edge off, you know, pure off the edge, a lot of inside moves and stuff. I want to see him like have a more diver- diverse set of moves. And also like, he just like flat out needs to stay healthy, like needs to stay healthy in the NFL. Yes. That's, that's the thing is I think it's very indicative of how important the pre-draft process is. If you go to a small school and maybe not small schools, maybe not a non power five school, because NFL is all about competition level, do it against the best competition and, and all about, you know, so when you go to the senior bowl, when you go to the combine, you are on a level playing field and he just didn't get to do that. He never got to level the playing field. So his tape always comes with this asterisk of, oh yeah, but who's it against? Oh yeah, but who's he doing it against? And when you don't run a 40 pre-draft, when you don't go to the senior bowl pre-draft, you're just going to get passed up by guys that do and then tick that box, sadly. So I think that's unfortunate for him, but I still like him. I mean, day two picks are still obviously high on him. Eastern Washington has become an NFL factory. Cooper Cup, you may have heard of him. And this is from The Last Charger Fan. Where is the hype for the Walter Payton Award-winning best quarterback in FCS football in 2022 NFL Draft QB1, Eric Barriere from Eastern Washington? Hashtag fun to watch. Would also like to know your evaluation of Cooper Cup coming out of school. I like Cup, I like Cup a lot after the Senior Bowl. Um I didn't do a full. I thought you were about to say I like Barriere a lot. And I was like, dude, shut up. <laughs> I did do like a full. I wasn't the full wide receiver guy for us back then. But I thought he was really impressive. Um, did not expect this, quite obviously. But I thought you'd get a solid kind of number two wide receiver. Been a lot better than that, obviously. And then obviously the role he played this past year helped that out. Um, Barriere, though. Is that how you pronounce it? I, sure. I just Barrier. threw that one out. 5'10", 206. The guy is a twitchy 5'10", 206, though. Nimble. And plays with some onions, I wrote here after watching him. 25 turnover-worthy plays last year. He's going to sling it. I, I, I have the, My take on him is he is hashtag fun to watch for certain. No plays with no fear. And has a good arm for a guy 5'10", 206. I think an NFC West team should sign him purely for the scout team look of Kyler Murray. Honestly. Ooh. I mean, that's like 5'10", 206. Just like let that guy work on your practice squad and give you a nice little impersonation. What are you yeah. going to do? Have Jimmy Garoppolo be your Kyle Murray impression? That's not going to work. No. Get get Eric Barrier to do to give you a nice scout team look at Kyle. I kind of love that take. Yeah. I haven't watched him yet. I have to now, but mm-hmm. I think I love that take. And it, more more divisional – you know, more division teams if they have a guy that has a unique skill set try and go find you know yeah or even the cardinals just draft him just so you don't have to change your offense when backup comes in stop stop <laughs> all right this is david potty j would you would love to hear your thoughts on pit quarter pit, pit defensive back damari mathis why does there seem to be such a wide variance on him seems like he could be a steal if i can sneak in one more question what is christian watson's ceiling Oof, ceiling talk Love ceiling talk. Uh, so first, Mathis, the Pittsburgh corner, uh, very physical. I, I think the why you're going to see, he said, why is there such a wide variance is because he plays that too physical kind of game where like he gets, he sticks with receivers because he is grabbing receivers. And that's always going to be polarizing when certain guys play kind of like J.C. Horn last year. You had massive fans of J.C. Horn and you had people who were, you know, Sam Monson calling him not a first-round pick. Uh, Damari Mathis, last year, nine penalties. The year prior to that, full season prior to that, because he missed 2020 with a shoulder injury, but 2019, eight penalties. That's a lot for a collegiate corner because, again, there's no uh, legal contact. So it's all holdings, all PIs. So that's the worry with him. Heck of an athlete, though. Bigger wingspan for a smaller guy. 
definitely worth a pick somewhere on day two. But I'm always I'm wary of those guys because I I'm not sure that gets I'm not sure that gets fixed truthfully. I I think that's kind of just how guys play. So uh, that would be why ceiling of Christian Watson. I, I don't I, I worry. I worry about it. I, I don't think it's the limitless whatever that his combine would suggest. You know, everyone sees the 40, the vert, and is thinks because it's better than everyone else's that that makes him capable, like that makes him capable of being better than every single other person. I'm not sure. I think the ceiling for him is kind of like an MVS, Marcus Valles Gantling, where long vertical threat, but I'm not sure you're getting too much more. Someone sent me a Twitter DM that they wanted us to attack as well, and I'm not answering it. Someone, but I, I, mean, I don't even know how to reference it. Someone Watch. said, "What do you think of the Adam Anderson fit in Cleveland?" That's fucked. Yeah, <laughs> that's that that's not great. Don't send those DMs to me. This is from Hammer Two One Six. Big Lax fan here that wanted to ask if you guys think about Jared Bernhardt, QB from Ferris State. We're getting some deep cuts today as a draft prospect this year. He was able to win the Tewarton Award, the Heisman of Lax, two years ago for Maryland and transferred to Ferris for his COVID eligibility year. Decent athlete who might be able to play some wide receiver tight end, put up some saying stats at Ferris. Sadly, we do not have Ferris State tape. So I'm not going to go watch a highlight reel and try to give you takes on the guy when we don't have his tape. But uh, Here's my suggestion without ever seeing a single ounce of his tape. Go play Lax in the league. That Lax team looks sick. I covered the San Diego Seals for a little bit. Or, or, or. And? It was fun. San Diego Seals I don't Seals think they make money, though. No, they don't. No, they make money. It's just not a lot of money. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, you go like, get on an NFL practice squad, and you probably make, like, five times what you would make as a pro Lax player. No, yeah, but I just don't think this guy has a chance. If Moreno doesn't even have tape on him, I don't know if the NFL is looking at him. Um, I mean... Denver will probably look at him. Here are his pro day numbers for you. 6'1", 189, ran a 4'7", 6'9", 3 cone, 4'2", 1 shuttle, 32 inch vert, 9'10", oh, no. broad, 6 what? inch press reps. Ooh, he's got small hands, 8 and 3 eighths inch. So, Dude. Dude. So, that's a tough climb. Guess, the, guess how much a rookie NLL player makes. The National Lacrosse League, the biggest lacrosse league here in the United States. 15K. Nine thousand dollars. Oh, that's high. Nine thousand dollars. That's insane. I thought it would be like at least like, like like thirty k. Like yeah. like something like like they have to get. You can't even play that and not have a second job to survive. That's insane. I'm sorry, Quinn. You're right. Go get a practice squad. <laughs> Don't go just play lacrosse. You're kind of screwed. <laughs> that's insane. For a franchise player, your highest paid player. What is it? Guess. 15K. $34,000. The highest paid player makes $34,000. Damn. Dude, yeah. that's sad. I mean, you probably make more to coach lacrosse at that point, you know, at like a college. Yeah. A thousand percent. You Dude. know who else played uh, lacrosse? Who? In football? Jim Chris Brown. Hogan. Oh. And Jim Thorpe. Oh, wow. There's your player comp, Jim Brown. <laughs> <laughs> this is from eSport 2. What's a realistic? And, uh, Sam Hubbard, actually. He was He's originally. Oh, yeah, that's right. He originally committed, out, Cincy. Uh, I think, to Notre Dame for lacrosse. That's wild that he wanted to do the NFL instead of kind of chase that. I know, dude. 15 k that 9K a year. <laughs> can, what else can you sign up for that only pays you 9K that's that, like, enveloping of your life? I don't even know. Like, that's insane. Yeah. It almost feels like illegal. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, trying to, <laughs> I'm not trying to call it the NLL here, but... Well, I mean, if you think about how much time they probably practice plus games, it's probably not going to end up being that much a week. How many you think NFL? How many NLL games do you think? I mean, are? they probably can get like it's passes is probably a minimum wage job at least. They play eighteen games a season. Say they're three hours long. Mm -hmm. They're making about one hundred sixty bucks an hour. I guess they're getting well paid, but that doesn't count the practices and all that stuff. They're getting fleeced. Let's just call it. They're getting fleeced. Well, yeah, it's. Would you? Okay, here's a question. I mean, it's like it's a hot. It's it's basically a hobby at that point. Would you do a for nine thousand dollars a, a year? Hustle. Would you do for nine thousand dollars a year? Anything that took up eighteen Saturdays of your life, dude. I would play 
competitive basketball, football, baseball for nine thousand dollars a year. Okay, for real. okay, that's fair. Well, that's for fair. sure. And it takes up every Saturday. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. All right. All right. This is from Eport or Esport Two. What's a realistic stat line for Trevor Lawrence this season? Okay, so I went back. Kyler Murray's year two. He went for 3,971 yards, 67.2 completion percentage, 26 TDs, 12 interceptions. So this is year two, kind of a little breakout, whatever. I think you can expect a little more yards, a touch lower completion percentage, but that's hopefully, if t is going to be good, that's your starting point. That's where you want him to end up this season. So I think he has to hit it. Yeah. Right. Has to hit it. We need to see it from T-Law. This is from Bad News Barons. What are your guys' opinions on SMU players from last season? Tanner Mordecai, the quarterback, tight end Grant Calcaterra, wide receiver Danny Gray, and then wide receiver Ridge Robertson. I watched a lot of Robertson and Calcaterra. People keep telling me to watch Gray. He wasn't in my wide receiver rankings. I haven't watched him. I want to go back and watch Danny Gray. Gray's sweet. He's probably the best of the bunch. Mordecai, I don't think, is really much of an NFL uh, prospect. Calcaterra is a good wide receiver, but I just uh, we've talked about him in the tight end rankings. I think he's one of the best natural route runners in his class, but he is just... One undersized, two not an inline blocker, and three already retired because of concussions. So that's three strikes. Yeah, you know he he won't get drafted high with those three strikes. But if you need a receiver at the position, there aren't too many better in this class. Gray is dynamic. I mean, he ran low four threes at the combine. Sadly, only ran a few routes at the Senior Bowl before getting hurt. But he has separation ability is just a disastrous body catcher i mean he does not have good ball skills i think he had double digit drops each last two seasons i believe um so that's the worry with him uh roberson's just fringe nfl prospect truthfully i I, the acl coming back from that he did not look quite the same level of explosiveness and didn't test out particularly well i believe Oh, so he has 10 drops over the last two seasons. Excuse me, Danny Gray. Misspoke. Misremembered. But over a 10% drop rate over that span. Next question. Big check. Big Chuck, 99. Why does Austin get so upset about repeat review? Shouldn't engagement be encouraged and not punished? You're right, honestly. And I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm going to say I'm sorry. Can I say I'm sorry? Number two. If the Giants wanted to double up on one side of the ball in the first and address the other side on their their day three, day two pick... What would be the best way to do that? Example, Icky Neal with Leo Chanel or Sauce Gardner Tibbs with Ryman. I like defense. Defense, yeah. I like I, if you went Thibodeau and Sauce, that mm-hmm. would be sick. Mm-hmm. And then go get Bernard Ryman, your top twenty player on the board in round two or, mm-hmm. or, or day two. I think that's uh, that's the better better way for I sure. Agree. Yeah, I agree. Just because like going Icky and Neal, the offense stops just not there. You know? Yeah, it's just diminishing returns to two alignment for that line with two premium picks. I just, and I look, what are you gonna do with Andrew Thomas? Are you gonna put Icky at right guard? Are you gonna move Neil into guard? Then you got, do they still have Matt Peart there that they want to Maybe they're both guards. Maybe you put him, that's what the coach said. Right? Maybe we're all guards. This is from Tickle Whisper. Uh, on the ana- analytics woke scale from Sam Monson to Eric Eager. So Sam Monson, I think is the low end of analytics woke. Is he? And then Eric Eager is obviously the high end of analytics woke. I'm not even sure he's the highest of the high at PFF, though. Who's the highest of the high? Like Timo. Okay. Where do you two and the various other PFF analysts land? I'm below Sam Monson. You kidding me? <laughs> You're below Sam Monson on the analytics woke scale? I don't think that's – I don't know. What do you, I don't even know what the analytics woke scale is. <laughs> how often do you bring up running backs and how much you hate them? Is that like – what's the scale exactly? Like everything has to be – running back still man. like yeah it's pure never follow anything but the numbers what part of the scale is i mean i, I i'm it's, it's very i'm very in the middle we do very need, we middle. do need a little bit more explanation on exactly yeah. what he means by analytics woke but i'm very in the middle i'm of the opinion that like all information is good information leverage it all situation yeah where i'm not all the way on the left side like there are some people on the so far side of someone in the quote unquote analyst community says something and they just want to disagree with it because they said it. Right. Mm-hmm. And then there's the other side where I think you agree with everything they say because they're in the data yeah. all day long. I think I'm somewhere in the middle there. Mm-hmm. This is from Almez five two oh two. Austin, what's your first team all interview team? Now that you've interviewed a solid bunch of players. Wow. Quarterback. Desmond Ritter. 
Running back, Miles Sanders. Wide receivers. Denzel Mims' interview was sick. I thought Denzel Mims was going to be like a future <laughs> Hall of Famer when I came out of it. His interview was awesome. Um, other receiver that I would probably pair with Denzel Mims? Hmm. JJ Ortega Whiteside. Maybe the interview process is bad for receivers because like, Ortega Whiteside's interview was also sick. He was really cool. Um, tight end. I don't talk to a lot of tight ends. I don't know if I'd have like a first team all tight end interview. That's tough. Um, I talked to, yeah, I don't know. Not, I don't know if I have a good interview. Left tackle is obviously Jonah Williams. Jonah Williams, one of the best interviews I've ever done. He was super cool. Super nice guy. Guard. You know who the best guard interview ever was? Who? Braden Smith. Who now obviously plays tackle for the Indianapolis Colts. Maybe O-line. Sick. Maybe O-line's, maybe where, O-line's maybe where it's at. Center, I don't talk to a lot of centers. If Zion Johnson plays center, I thought his interview was great. Okay. I, I think he was a really a fun interview. I think I've talked to Linderbaum as well, too, potentially. And he was sick. So, um, going to defense. Edge defender, Brian Burns. Brian Burns' interview was unreal. He mm-hmm. was an awesome. Oh, I can't say that. Aiden Hutchinson. <laughs> oh, Aiden Hutchinson, I mean. No, but I think Aiden Hutchinson and Brian Burns are two of the best we got, ones. Yeah, I was going to say, you got two edge defenders. Yeah, I'll go Aiden Hutchinson on the other one. Aiden Hutchinson's interview was sick, too, obviously. Uh, Brian Burns was really cool. Defensive tackle? Not Jerry Tiller. Not Jerry Tillery. I haven't talked to a lot of defensive tackles where I've come away, like, really wholesale impressed. Like, I remember Derek Naughty. I wasn't, you know, I didn't come out of it. With, uh, if that was good. I mean, in terms of, like, best interview, I don't know if it was up there. Jerry Tillery, I don't think, was great. Um Talk to a handful of other guys, but I don't know. Uh, DeMarvin Leal, I thought was cool. Maybe he plays defensive tackle or somewhere in that mm-hmm. range. Off ball linebacker, Troy Anderson's got to be up there. I just talked to him, but he was sick. Really fun player to talk to. Cornerback, Byron Murphy. Byron Murphy was a fantastic interview. Super fun guy. Um, other corner here. Hmm. What other corner? Oh, uh, Patrick Sertan. Patrick Sertan was another really sick interview. Super smart and had that with him. Asante Samuel Jr., I give an honorable mention. Safety. I liked Brandon Joseph. He's not in this draft class, but I think Brandon Joseph of Northwestern. Of Notre Dame. Of Notre Dame, sorry. He's not at Notre Dame. I think he was a good safety. So I'm going to give that as my first team all-interview squad. I'm probably missing some guys with how many people I've talked to, but I'm going to give it that. From John Paul Dongo. Do you think Linderbaum could fall out of round one? No. I don't think so. I really don't. I don't think, so. I don't think he falls out of round one. Also, what's the best case scenario for the Jets at 35 and 38? Stick and pick? Ooh, I, I, did we say that a lot? I kind of like that. Stick and pick. All right, I'm going to stick and pick. pick. And then, or, or do they trade up? I, I don't think trade up. I will be honest. Because um, I think that's the deep part of the draft. If anything, move down. Like, that's a loaded, it's a fertile ground. What I would say is, uh, kind of ass- assuming they go D-line wide receiver with their first two picks. That's kind of been the popular mocks to them. I would lean Kyer Elam, pick 35, Jalen Petrie, pick 38. That would be a sick combo, in my opinion, to solidify a struggling secondary. Austin needs a nose ring 42069. Two more questions. This one and then the next one. Man, I can't believe he had that before you even... Let's start listening to the pod. I know. What were the biggest mistakes in the NFC East in the last few years by PFF grades? Yeah, I'm not sure the grades really help with I that. I don't know. Yeah. But we'll just say the biggest mistakes from each team. Uh, for the Giants, it was every free agent they signed. Uh, for the Cowboys, it was the Zeke deal to then trade cut Amari Cooper and Lyle Collins. For the Washington Commanders, it was Dan Snyder committing money laundering. Stop. That was not the worst. And for... It's anything Dan Snyder... Any decision Dan Snyder has made, period. Because cool. Dan... It's... Yeah. It, what, or was it Carson Wentz wearing the hot dog suit? Or you know, just they, In terms Wentz. of just laughability, there is a lot there. Um, and for the Eagles, probably Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson. I think that was quick and easy, but it was great. I think that was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, last one. <laughs> a lot of to choose from. <laughs> last one. This is from Lipsito T. Which receivers that could realistically be available at 33 would be the best fit for Trevor Lawrence and the Jags? George Pickens. That's the dream. That's your number one potential sort of guy that would is something you just don't have. That's your ideal scenario. The more I look over this draft, the more I believe, though, he's going to the Packers or Chiefs to the back end of round one. I love it. I think George Pickens should comfortably be a first-round player. I think that'd be insane if he is available on day two. That's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the pod if you want to continue 
to get on the mailbag episodes, make sure you rate, review, and subscribe. Drop a five-star review, leave your question in there, and we will make sure to answer it. Until next week, we got off-ball linebacker rankings, cornerback rankings, safety rankings, one more mailbag, and guess what week it is? Draft week? Draft week. Birthday week? It's your birthday, too. No, I don't. What are we doing for your birthday? Watching draft prospects. Not going to rage? Probably going to read 2023 NFL mocks. Let's go. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of Tailgate. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the pod. See you guys later.